let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We pray in the words that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, just a few things that I want to uh, point out that this whole class is going to be supported um, with some stuff online. So on our parish uh, website, you'll be able to go there to get the class notes, the outline, the little worksheets uh, that we have, and um, a video of the class. So, for example, somebody has to work, somebody you have an emergency with your kids or whatever, uh, you can follow the class, you know, watch it, read it, do the worksheet, and uh, stay up. So there's, there'll always be that opportunity. Um, you know, it's better to be here, um, but there is that backup. Um, also, there, there are going to be follow-up meetings and even some preliminary meetings, I think, with some folks um, that we'll do kind of parallel to this. But if you'll come to six classes, we'll have the majority of, uh, of the work uh, done and, and you know, the, the coursework, the intellectual part of the formation, but also some of the spiritual formation as well. So I appreciate that. And um, if anybody doesn't have a packet... <laughs> so we have those things that will come up during the week uh, following the class and uh, you can stay up or you know one of the couple can't be here that we can watch. All right. A couple of things I want to uh, to start with so you understand the, the outline of the class, what we're doing. Uh, every sacrament has uh, a similarity to our primary sacrament, which is uh, our first one, which is baptism. And so if we take the model that we use for forming people for baptism, the RCIA uh, model, it's uh, sort of uh, the model in some ways for every other sacrament. And so we have a period, for example, of inquiry, um, and then there's a period of enlightenment, and there is a period of conversion, uh, a period of intense uh, spiritual preparation, and then finally, uh, when the sacrament is received, then there's a period of reflection on that sacrament. And so that's the whole RCIA process is like that, and there's a similarity with every other sacrament uh, that we receive. And so marriage being no different is going to have those elements. And then uh, there's another, there's four components of every kind of formation. Um, Elaine McCarthy, what are the four pillars of, found, uh, of formation? Um, spirituality, so prayer. Um, I think it was. What's the little acronym? Oh, ship. There you go. H. So spiritual, human, intellectual, and pastoral or apostolic, right? So every, all Christian formation um, has these four elements, right? Spiritual formation, human formation. Intellectual, and this is, I love this because I never can spell intellectual. My weak spot. And then pastoral, when it's in, in the case of priestly formation, otherwise apostolic formation, we call it for laity. So these are going to be, of course, included in the course uh, that we have. Tonight, I want to begin um, with a little short explanation of something why marital preparation. Um, is important, and also why certain aspects of our formation are necessary, even if you have a non-Catholic uh, spouse uh, that you're going to marry, uh, because understanding the sacrament is, is absolutely necessary for us to, to receive it well, because marriage has a very unique uh, aspect to it in, in the sacrament, which is this. Every other sacrament that you receive from the, from the Catholic Church, the minister 
imparts the sacrament to the recipient, okay? Baptism, right? Priest or deacon or somebody baptizes uh, the person who's baptized. In confirmation, the bishop, or in some cases, uh, like at the Easter vigil, it would be the priest. Uh, she's got some copies of the packets. And then uh, Holy Communion, right? The priest consecrates the Eucharist, gives it to the person who receives it. All the sacraments work that way, except for one, which is marriage. Because in marriage, the couple gives the sacrament to each other. Aha. So you all are, in a sense, in here tonight, uh, beginning a little course in how to become ministers of the sacrament of holy matrimony to each other. Okay? So there's... Uh, this is why the, the preparation for marriage is so important and it has to be done in a particular way so that you can communicate that sacrament to each other, right? Um, because it takes two people uh, intending the same things uh, at, the, at the same time, right? And so uh, that's how the sacrament of, of, of holy matrimony is... Uh, if you will, uh, imparted or confected, maybe we might even say, uh, to make an analogy to the Eucharist. All right. Also, um, married life is uh, so crucial in, in the development because one of the things that happens is that two become one flesh. There is a union of life that happens, so it's necessary for both partners, even if, uh, if, uh, if one is not a Catholic person, to understand uh, what is happening so that they can understand what's expected, what's necessary to bring about uh, the sacrament that's going to support the marriage. Uh, but the sacrament is there uh, to, to bring about and open a world of a call, right, to holiness that comes to the couple. So we're going to talk about tonight primarily two things. One is the call to holiness, Right, that is uh, that is at the foundation of of holy matrimony. Right, a call to holiness. So, um, the question is, it begs itself, what is holiness? And so, we begin with just a little definition. It's the first question I think on your outline there. Uh, if you'll follow along with that, uh, just just a little sort of little catechism that you'll end up with at the end of uh, our classes. So, the first question. Uh, is what are the two aspects of holiness? So the two aspects of holiness in life are uh, they consist in the separation from sin and those things that lead to sin and then secondarily a, the call to holiness is uh, it consists in a union with the will of God. All right? So those two aspects, separating ourselves from sin and then uniting ourselves with the will of God. Those are the uh, really the foundations of holiness. Holiness in human beings and angels is due to a gift of God known as sanctifying grace. And this gift is a quality given to the soul. It elevates uh, the soul above its natural state so that a person has a share in the life of God. So what it, uh, sanctifying grace is a share in the life of God. Where he begins to dwell in our souls. Right? Um, that primarily is imparted to us through baptism is the, is the opening door to that. Sanctifying uh, grace is called a, a habitual gift, meaning uh, it's a stable and supernatural disposition. It perfects the soul, and uh, the soul itself is enabled to live with God and to act by His love. This is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. This is Jesus' uh, commentary on that, if you will. Remain in me as I remain in you. He says, just as a branch cannot bear fruit on its own unless uh, it remains on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit because without me you can do nothing. See, Jesus wants to remain in us in order to make us holy, right? Uh, to bring about a, a life of sanctity by us acting uh, with the will of God, uniting yourself with the will of God. So this indwelling of God living in your soul um, is sanctifying grace that's necessary for us to truly become holy. Right? And remember those aspects of holiness. Separation from sin, 
union with the will of God. All right, so the second question is, why should I be holy? Why, why does that matter to me? Um, why is God calling you to be holy? And as human beings, we're created to be united to God. God made us for this purpose. And the very reason why people exist is to be united with God forever in heaven, right? The uh, famous first question of the, the, uh, the Baltimore Catechism, right? Why did God may, make me? To know Him, to love Him, uh, to serve Him in this life, and to be with Him forever in heaven, be happy with Him in heaven. God made us for union with Him. That's what we're made for. It's our purpose. And so holiness is going to be all about uh, achieving that, right? So why should you want to be holy? Because that's what you're made for, right? That's what God made you for. God has called, uh, the f first reason we should want to be holy is that God called me to be holy, right? Each one of us can say that. God called me to be holy. This is um, in question number two. Secondly, sin is degrading to the human person. Right? And it makes any kind of relationship, especially marriage, difficult if not impossible. Uh, sin takes away from, uh, from our dignity as human beings. And so our reason, one of our motives for wanting to be holy is to want to be whole. Right? To, be, uh, to have the dignity that God has in mind for you and I. Right? He wants us uh, to be holy and to bear all the dignity uh, that we were created with. We're made in His image, right? Uh, there's a third aspect of this. Holiness is a way to perfect fulfillment and eternal happiness. I will never, uh, as St. Augustine said, we, never, we will not uh, rest until we rest in God, right? We're going to always be restless. We're going to be unfulfilled until we have God uh, fully, right? And that absolutely happens in heaven. But in this life, uh, our sense of uh, fulfillment and satisfaction, our sense of happiness, if you will, uh, joy, I, I would uh, rather use, but happiness is uh, more or less equivalent to that, is something that is only achievable, really, if we, have, uh, if we have God as the object of what we're desiring. So these are, these are reasons and motives for wanting to be holy. Uh, the third question uh, that we want to touch on here is, what does holiness have to do with happiness? I, I asserted that it makes you happy. Well, is that true, and why, uh, why is that true if it is true? What does holiness have to do with happiness? Well, creation is God sharing his own perfection and goodness. In fact, creating creatures with which he's able to share his goodness and happiness is, uh, Scripture says, the glory of God consists, uh, or this is the catechism rather, consists in the realization of this manifestation and communication of goodness for which the world was created. Remember at the beginning of creation, God created everything and saw that it was good, right? God is the one that asserted that His creation is good. And so, uh, this is our... the. The, it's, it's natural to us, right, to creation. Uh, we are good, but fallen. We say uh, we are wounded by sin, but we were made good. We're made in the image and likeness of God. God has said that uh, His creation is good, right? And so it's uh, when we sin, we take away from that picture. Uh, and so our desire, why should we, uh, what does holiness have to do with happiness, is that our happiness is going to come from living out what we were made for, right? Um, we can see this in material things, right? You have a bicycle and you're trying to use it as a hammer to, you know, fix something, right? Uh, it doesn't work well, right? It's not what it's made for. And the same, same thing is true for human beings. If we use, uh, if we uh, do what we were made for, we'll be happy, right? A bike is happy when it's riding down the road and it's working well, right? Uh, that's when it's happy. Uh, it's doing what it's supposed to do, if you will, right? Uh, human beings are happy, right? They're fulfilled when we're doing what we were made to do. What we were made to do, uh, what we're made in the image and likeness of God. And so if we're doing the things that unite us to God's will and separate us from sin, we're going to have joy, which leads to happiness, right? right. So um, the reason it's necessary to be 
holy in order to be happy right, is because holiness consists in, uh, in separating from sin, uniting with God, and those are the things that will also make us happy. So unless we're, unless we're seeking holiness, we're not going to be happy. Right? We're going to end up in circumstances, uh, right? choices that we make that have, uh, uh, that have ramifications for our lives that are unhappy. Right? Um, it's just that's going to be put in our pathway. The, the choices we make are going to make us unhappy if they're not in union with God's will. Right? God gave us the commandments not as a burden, but as, you know, as a gift to steer us right, to heaven. And so when we do things in accord with the commandments, uh, we're going to find that our life here on earth, first of all, is fulfilling, right? Uh, of course we're going to have burdens and, and suffer and do all this stuff, but we're going to know the direction, right? Because we know where we're going. We know that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're doing what we're made to do, right? When we do those things in accord with God's will, right, naturally, we're, we're going to be happier. Look at the lives of the saints. Even the saints that suffered tremendously, right, wildly happy in this life, right? Not uh, despairing of this life, not hating this life, loving this life, right? They're happy because they're holy. They're seeking God's will. So that's uh, something for us to, to know and to, to uh, be certain about. Um, did I answer uh, your question on number three? Since we're made from God, nothing else is good enough, right? There's nothing else that's good enough. Uh, we're made for God. We're made for the eternal. And so material, limited things cannot satisfy us, right? Uh, so on 3a, we're made for God, so nothing else is good enough. And nothing else uh, can really satisfy us. And this is why uh, people seek, you know, money and things and fame and, you know, all, they try to fill themselves with it and they're never satisfied. We're not made for those things. God didn't make us for uh, uh, for food. God didn't make us for you know wealth. God made us for Himself to be happy with Him in heaven. And when we're seeking God uh, and we're in union with God, right? That's when we're truly uh, satisfied. Right? Nothing else is good enough. Right? Don't sell your, yourself short. Nothing is good enough for you except God. How about that? Right. That. Uh, tells you what your human dignity is, right? Nothing is good enough for you except God. And that's why we can forsake anything else in the world except God. Right? So all those things are dispensable. You can't take any of them with you when you go. All right. Um, question number four. Why is holiness difficult? Right? Um, so if it's so great, uh, you paint this beautiful picture... Then why is it hard? Why wouldn't holiness be just the easiest thing to do? Everybody would be holy, right? If, if it's easy, um, people would be naturally attracted to it, right? That's uh, what we imagine. Well, it should be natural to us, except for original sin, right? Original sin uh, is what makes holiness difficult. Um, so holiness is difficult because of original sin. Adam had been given a special role in the history of mankind, uh, and God had decided to let man have a real share in his work and, uh, and had decided to give the rest of mankind the supernatural and preternatural gifts through Adam. And his children are, are not only made in the image and likeness of God, but they're also, uh, in a sense, in the image and likeness of Adam, right? The first man. And when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness after his image. This is uh, Genesis 5.3. Since Adam um, had thrown the gifts away, though, he could not pass them off to us. Instead, he passed on the guilt and the effects of original sin. God had promised Adam the role of head of the human race, and he did not change his mind. When Adam failed, the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Had, had, had Adam remained in God's friendship, we would have received this grace and friendship by the very fact that we were the sons and daughters of Adam. Instead, we receive a wounded nature. Every person is still meant for heaven, but cannot reach it on their own. Right? This is why we need a Savior, right? because of the fall, because of original sin. This is why we need Jesus Christ in our lives uh, and for our salvation. All right, the next question uh, is, 
why is being holy the most loving thing that I can do? God did not uh, deem it enough to give us good things or even ourselves, but God has given, uh, has given mankind the greatest of all things, Himself. But He's also made us to love another, to love and to be loved, and thus a living image of His triune life. Right? In God there are three persons loving each other. And so we would imagine if we're made in the image and likeness of God, then guess what? One of our primary things is going to be that we're made to love others as well. Right? Primarily that other is God, but it's also going to include uh, other human beings. For this is the message which you have heard. This is uh, 1 John 3. This is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, little children. Let us not... Uh, let us not love in the in word of speech only, but in deed and in truth. And so God has made us reliant on each other. By loving God and by becoming holy, I open my heart to love others. I think that's uh, the question. Uh, number five. Why is being holy the most loving thing I can do for my spouse uh, as it relates to you? So by loving God and becoming holy, I open my heart to uh, to love others. This allows for a deeper union in marriage and a more perfect love and service for the other and truly helping the other reach their holiness and happiness. On the contrary, refusing to love God means to take the other person as, as something good only for a period of time, refusing to love them for eternity, uh, but, but only for a few years. It means that I become less lovable and less, less able to love. God wishes us to help him make the other person holy and therefore happy. That's why if you seek holiness in your, in your life, in your uh, marriage, that is going to benefit your spouse, not just you. Right? It's going to please God and benefit your spouse. 